And we have another game with the white pieces. Let's play e4. Now, most people at this level, of course, do play e5. This guy plays the Alakine. Now, the Alakine, <laughs> it's a hypermodern opening. I, I know it's become a meme at this point for me to talk about that. And the drawback of the Alakine is that it doesn't push any pawns. And when you push your, when you get your pieces out first, those pieces become at a very fundamental level susceptible to attacks by the pawns. And that is why White's best and most topical move in this position is considered e4 to e5. Which on on its face is a pretty pretty risky move. If you think about it, just like pushing your pawn up is not something you should do lightly. The issue is Black doesn't have any of his pawns out. And so this knight, okay, so knight g4 is not, yeah, mango ingp, the real prophet. Okay, he resigns instantly. That blunders the knight. Um, yeah, that blunders the knight. And, and, and one thing that I often see, by the way, to make a quick lesson out of this, knight d5, of course, being the move here. Um, there's two things I have to say on a serious note. Yeah, let's analyze it. <laughs> the first is, when you have a committal pawn move like that, you have to understand what squares have been left behind. So what squares are now accessible to your pieces that were previously inaccessible. That can help you update your board state, so to speak, and not miss moves like knight d5, right? Which were previously impossible because you had a pawn on e4. Uh, by the way, like knight c3 is also a possible move. This transposes into Vienna, but this would transpose into a favorable version of the Scandinavian. So d5 actually is a very solid move as well. Now I'm playing black. Once again, I'm gonna play very positionally with black. That's the concept behind the speedrun, at least at the start as we rise through the beginner ranks. So e3, the Van Cruz. I mean, e3 is not a terrible move. I'll talk a little bit about the general mentality you should have with offbeat openings. I mean, e5, this is sort of a reverse French. I mean, there's nothing wrong inherently about playing a reverse French. Thank you, risky play. But bishop c4 is, is not good. So he's not developing his knight before his bishop. Um, he's not doing a great job of occupying the center and uh, he's giving us a chance to occupy the center with tempo via the move d5, attacking the bishop, right? He might give us a check on b5, um, but that's clearly not scared. Bishop b3. Okay, so I think that some players get the temptation here to play c5 and to continue occupying the center with pawns. But as I've made very clear in the first speedrun, controlling the center is a, is a balance between... Controlling with pawns, obviously, on the, on the one hand, but on the other hand, not overdoing it and, and not forgetting to develop your pieces. Because, you know, and again, this has become a meme at this point, but there are openings designed to overextend you in the sense that you control the center with too many pawns and then those pawns start to crumble. So instead of playing c5, let's focus on piece development. Let's go knight f6, supporting the pawn. Where should this f8 bishop go? What, what would be, well, okay, not immediately. He's got knight c3. So one possibility is just to go knight c6. Yes, so the ideal square for the bishop is definitely d6. Several reasons. It supports e5, and in the event that white castles short, which is very likely, you can envision a scenario where we play the move e5, e4, and this, you know, this sets up potential Greek gift sacrifice ideas or attacking ideas. Now, um, can we play bishop d6 immediately? And if not, why not? And what can you propose to fix the problem before you play bishop d6? So it's not knight b5 that's the problem. And I'll explain why afterwards. But you're close. It's knight takes d5, right? Knight takes d5 wins the pawn. So a great move in this position is c7 to c6. Defending the pawn with another pawn, building up a pawn chain, always a good thing and paving the way for bishop d6. Now, I know what some of you guys are thinking. Like, doesn't this take away the c6 square for that? Where are we gonna put this knight? And I think the way that some players are taught um, is slightly, um, you know, it, it, it's reasonable when you're first learning to always wanna put your knights on c6 and, and f6, but you can you can put your knight on d7. That's It's not the end of the world um, in most cases. And you shouldn't think of it as a huge concession or anything of that sort. C6 and F6 are the conventional squares. They're usually going to be the best squares. But chess is a game of trade-offs. Sometimes you have to do something in a slightly inferior manner. Um, and that doesn't mean your position is bad. So here we play bishop d6 as we had intended, right? Supporting the pawn. 
Yeah, so I'll explain after the game the Zen behind why we didn't play Bishop E6. That would not have been a bad move, by the way, but I think C6 is better. And there is a, a principle that stands behind that. Knight G5, sort of a, a typical a typical move, um, but it doesn't actually do anything, right? It just sort of... Now, not, the reason Knight G5 is usually played is to attack F7, but here we're not... White is not attacking F7. So H6 is a very uh, sensible reaction to this. But what I would advocate and what I would do here in the name of playing more solidly is actually just to ignore this. What I want to show you guys is if we just castle this single knight, even though it looks scary, and I remember Hafu, Robert Hess, uh, my partner in crime, he was telling me Hafu had this you know issue at first um, where, where she was afraid of moves like knight g5. And there was a, an aha moment when she realized that uh, that a piece doesn't do anything just, just because it's it's on your side of the board. It actually could be an asset for you. And this is where it becomes an asset for us. Um, what should we do now? He's got an e4. He's trying to control more of the center, but he's not ready for it. His pieces are all over the place. And now we can play h6, attack the knight. If the knight moves, then this e4 pawn is attacked twice and only defended once, once the knight moves. He can try a fishing pole idea with h4. I don't think it's going to work though. Uh, and if he does that, we'll deal with that when it comes, when, when he plays it. Right? So by reserving h6 for a more opportune moment, we're going to gain more from playing it. Thank you, Bullseye 8080. Now, you shouldn't take this too far. Sometimes, like a move like knight g5 really is scary. Um, none of this should be taken too generally. But because white hasn't really developed his pieces particularly well and we have a strong pawn center, there's no reason we should fear this. Okay, so there's several things we could do. We could take on e4, that's the typical move. We could take the knight and ruin his pawn structure, but that's a little bit double-edged because that also opens up the g file. And you guys should be able to see right off the bat why that could actually backfire in some cases. So if we were to play in a very simple way, let's just take the pawn, let's not even bog ourselves down too much um, and and kill you know unnecessary time trying to evaluate whether bishop takes h3 is good and the point that i want to make here is oftentimes if you're agonizing over a decision do i take that piece do i trade simply not doing it um, and finding an alternative can be a very good practical solution right um, in most positions you're going to have several good alternatives um, and if you see the bigger picture and you can save yourself a lot of time and a lot of um, negative sort of emotions by cutting out this kind of vacillation that often happens. All right. Uh, yeah, bishop g4. Now, that's not the best move. I just want to show that even playing in this very simple way can, can be very powerful or at least powerful enough to beat pretty decent players. Um, Okay, so rook f1. Now, he's maybe was trying to castle, I don't know. Uh, but in any case, this leaves his king stranded in the center. Um, and not only does it leave his king stranded in the center, I'm also noticing that he hasn't touched most of his queen side, which essentially means that his queen is actually really hemmed in. And because it's hemmed in, what move comes to mind immediately to exploit that? I mean, this is simple. Bishop g4 attacking the queen. The queen has no squares. He's going to have to either move the knight back and block it. Oh, that's ugly. Or he's going to have to play f3. And if he plays f3, we take it. He takes back, and then the knight loses the support of the g2 pawn. Okay, so f3, we take that pawn. And now he loses more stuff. He can avoid taking this pawn. Then we're going to take his pawn with a discovered... I mean, this is just completely crushing. And we didn't even really do anything tactical here. We just played sensible developing moves. Okay. I think when you first start chess as a kid, particularly as a young kid, I know it's it's very cliche to, to advocate this trope, but fun is incredibly important. It's more important sometimes than like maximizing immediate learning. So puzzles, for example, are going to be more important at the start than like, yeah, you have to finish this chess book um, and, you know, you have to develop a relationship where they're not 
crushed by a loss. That has to happen early as well. Okay, so now we take the queen, and the game is over. We're off the queen. The hero is going for the tier one. Okay, so he resigns. We're over 700. And, you know, again, um, on unlock, thank you for the prime. So E3, I think this is called the Van, Van Cruise opening, technically. Or it can be thought of as a reverse French. Now, if you are playing a reverse French, you can play D4. You can even play E4, and then you have E4, E5 with colors reversed. Um, but Bishop C4 is... Um, and, and that's a sort of classic, you know, that's a that's a beginner a, a category of mistakes that you'll see pretty often. Which I would say, there's like two dials, right? You have the control the center dial, and then the developer pieces dial. And when those are miscalibrated, you can do too much of one, too little of the other. And that's what you see here. Like, white hasn't done enough controlling the center with pawns, and he's hastily getting the pieces out. And that can be very ineffective. The weight of the pieces isn't felt. So that's why it's, it's so important to play one of these two moves and to focus on controlling at least part of the center with pawns. Then you guarantee yourself, and this might have been a mouse slip. Um, so anyways, e5, bishop, c4, d5. Now the one instructive moment here, I think, is in this case, some people are asking, well, why don't I essentially solve two problems at once and get my bishop out, d defend this pawn and prepare bishop d6. And the rule that I, that I, you know, sort of talked a lot about in the previous speed run is uh, a principle that essentially says w when there's anything that you want to do, right, the task that you want to accomplish on the board, Generally speaking, it's going to be the better to accomplish it with the piece of, a, of least value. Um, okay, so what does that mean? Now, in this case, you want, to, you want to support the pawn. You can do that with a bishop, or you can do it with a pawn. The pawn is, has less value, so you want to use the pawn. And the motivation behind the Zen behind that is simply that you want to leave open. Uh, you want to be as flexible as possible. You want your heavy-duty pieces to have the freedom to do the important things on the board. And you don't want to burden them too early with stuff that you could be doing with a pawn. By the same token, you know, you don't usually want to relegate your rook to a defensive task if you can perform the same task just as well with a bishop. Thank you, just call me Kyle. Now that's a, you know, that should be taken with a major grain of salt because in many cases, you know, you have to consign a rook to a defensive task because maybe the bishop isn't as good at it. And bishop b6 is, by no means is this a mistake or a bad move. But c6, not only is this following the principle, but it's actually more robust to defend this pawn with another pawn. This creates a pawn chain, and so the bishop is essentially taken out of commission. I hope that makes sense. So knight f3, bishop d6, knight g5, right? We ignore. Castles, e4, h6, attacking the knight. He drops the knight back. With d takes e4. Now, the, technically, the best sequence here would be to go bishop g4, attack the queen, force him to play f3, that weakens this diagonal. Now we take the knight. Now we look at this position. What do we want to accomplish? Well, we want the queen to land. Yeah, so there's definitely more to talk about. And all of these concepts that I'm laying out right now, in general terms, I'm going to try to expand on further when I get to a higher rating. That's the sort of progression, right? We, we go into more detail. Whoa, the Stephen Gray with five gifted. Oh, okay. Um, so we will uh, delve into all of these concepts. Uh, in, in greater detail but now it's time for me to pause i have to go i have some sessions coming up i will see you guys later thank you so much everybody for the support for keeping it wholesome i always appreciate it uh this community is awesome so hope you guys enjoyed your time have a good rest of the day enjoy peter's lecture and um i'll see you guys later bye everybody